It was the early days of spring, and the gentle touch of the March sun brought warmth to the air, gradually lengthening the days. Irma cherished this time of year, her spirit dancing with anticipation for something unexpected, magical, and wonderful. However, as the evening descended, she returned home in a dreadful mood. That morning had been unkind to Irma. Misfortune struck when she lost her purse, containing all her hard-earned money, and to compound her distress, she fared poorly in her philosophy exam. As if fate had a twisted sense of humor, a careless driver raced past her, casting a wave of muddy slush upon her pristine white jacket as she emerged from the subway. Her heart heavy, Irma observed the bustling city life around her, teeming with people in a hurry, their purpose consuming them. In a corner near the underpass, an elderly woman sold bouquets of mimosa, a true emblem of spring. Delicate yellow blooms adorned the slender branches, contrasting softly against the remnants of melting snow, akin to a long-awaited ray of sunshine piercing through the somber sky. Irma gazed at the flowers, momentarily captivated, unaware of the metallic grate embedded in the asphalt. With an abrupt movement, her foot caught on the grate, causing her heel to snap. Damn, Irma muttered in frustration. The day had already been burdened with enough misfortune, and now this. It felt as if an unyielding curse clung to her. Aching tears welled up in her eyes as she pitted her own plight. Slowly, she ambled towards the bus stop, her steps laden with dejection. The chill in the air sent a shiver through her body, prompting her to pull her woolen scarf higher. Great, just what I need, a cold, she lamented, longing for the day to be over. She said to herself, fortunately, on the bus, she sat by the window and stared out at the gloomy streets. It was already dark outside the city. Lights and car headlights flashed. The girl watched them and felt her eyelids closing. It seemed that she would fall into a deep sleep in a moment. Suddenly, Irma felt someone pat her on the shoulder. She didn't pay attention at first as she thought it was some passenger who had accidentally touched her, but soon it happened again. Irma turned around in displeasure. She was well-mannered and usually stood up at the sight of an older person and offered them a seat. But today, Irma felt unwell and the last thing she wanted was standing in a crowded bus. She was sure someone will call her a young boar who dares to sit while the elderly people are standing. However, to the girl's surprise, a young man with a bouquet of mimosas was tapping her on her shoulder. Please forgive me for disturbing you. I see that you are very tired, but it seemed to me that you need a charge of positive energy and optimism right now. The stranger smiled. I don't know what happened to you, but I'm sure that the end of this day can be fixed, at least I hope so. Please take my humble gift. These lovely flowers demand that you give me your charming smile. In return, the man handed Irma a bouquet, which he most likely bought near the subway. It was very unexpected and heartwarming. It was much more pleasant than if she had been scolded as she had expected. Thank you, but you shouldn't. Irma replied, the girl guessed that he bought these flowers not for her, and she was sure it was wrong to accept any gifts from strangers, even though this stranger was very handsome. Why don't you like these flowers? Yes, it's not orchids or roses, but mimosas are also incredibly beautiful. The generous, smiling passenger said Irma felt very uncomfortable. She thought he would think she was not satisfied with such a modest bouquet and wanted something exotic and more expensive. But that was not the case. The man was sincere and she did not want to offend him or refuse him, especially in front of the many curious passengers who were tirelessly watching the scene as if they were watching some reality show on TV. I should accept the gift Arma thought. After all, the guy wanted to do something good, to cheer up the sad stranger in a world full of indifference to others. Such actions are extremely rare. Thank you, Irma said, smiled and took the bouquet. There was an awkward pause. She didn't know what to do to turn away and continued looking out the window or to continue the conversation. Somehow in her twenties, 
Irma didn't have much experience in dating and interacting with men, and she had no idea how to behave in such situations. My name is Luis. The guy introduced himself, and I guess you and I are neighbors as far as it is possible in a big city. What makes you think that she asked? It's simple as the last bus stop is almost here and there aren't too many options. She couldn't help but ask who the flowers were for. For my mother, Luis answered. Sometimes I give her flowers for no reason just to please her, but it's okay if I give her flowers tomorrow. Maybe you should give these flowers to your mom. She said handing the mimosa back to him. No. No. The young man protested these flowers want to be with you. Oh, really? I must smile. Did they tell you that? Yes, they told me so they whispered it to me. When we got on the bus and saw your sad eyes, I could not resist their will. Irma found the boy's ingenuity very amusing. She wanted to say something but didn't have time. And here's my stop. Louis suddenly exclaimed and wishing her a pleasant evening. Got off the bus, that's it. Irma wondered to herself. There will be no sequel to the story. He just made a nice present and disappeared. She expected Louis to walk her home and then asked for her phone number. She thought he would call her and ask her out on a date, but he did not even ask her name. He just melted into the March night, like the last snow. On the one hand, it was pleasant that there were such unselfish people who could do such a nice thing without asking for anything in return. But on the other hand, Verma was a little disappointed. Maybe he didn't like me. She thought maybe Irma looked arrogant, boring, or ungrateful. What a terrible day, the girl sighed, as she approached the entrance of her building. The next morning, Irma woke up with a fever. The doctor diagnosed her with an acute respiratory infection and told her to stay home and start treatment. She spent almost a week at home. The mimosa on her bedside table slowly began to fade during this time, but Irma did not want to throw it away. The yellow flowers reminded her of the mysterious stranger and associated her with surprise and serenity, a pleasant and unexpected gift. The chance encounter. She was so eager to repeat. Soon Irma recovered and returned to her studies. Meanwhile, spring was already here. The snow had almost melted, and it was getting very warm and sunny that evening. Irma hurried home. She was in high spirits first of all. Today was the first day she put on her new spring coat, which was hidden in the closet for so long and was waiting for warmer weather. And second, she finally passed her philosophy exam. And even the fact that the bus was delayed and she had to wait outside, did not ruin the young students' wonderful mood. I wish I had a beautiful French beret. Irma thought the wind is still cold, and she has only recently recovered. I think I should have given you a hat today. Someone said behind her, if the bus had been another 10 minutes late, I would have had time to run to the mall and buy it. Irma immediately recognized the pleasant voice. It was Luis. He was hiding his red nose in the collar of his sweater, and she could tell he was also freezing, waiting for a late bus. Good evening, Irma exclaimed, and then she scolded herself for greeting the boy too cheerfully. But she was really happy to see him again. Luis was standing there smiling broadly. I haven't seen you in a while. I thought you had moved somewhere. He said, I didn't see you on the bus last week. No, I haven't moved anywhere. I was sick last week. She said, nothing serious. I hope Louise said kindly. Just a typical cold, she replied and then added coldly. By the way, my name is Irma. I didn't have time to introduce myself. Last time you disappeared so suddenly, but you probably don't want to know my name. You are wrong. The young man said I wanted to know your name. All these days I have been blaming myself for not asking your name, though it is understandable. I was confused. 
I've never seen such a beautiful girl on public transport before. If the bus doesn't come in five minutes, I'll call a cab and in addition, I'll find out your home address. Irma laughed, embarrassed Lee Lewis smiled cheerfully and then said, I'm a university student and I work part-time by writing term papers and essays. I don't earn that much, but it's enough for a couple of cab rides and a bouquet of flowers. Wow! Irma was surprised. And how much does it cost to order an essay from you? It depends on who is the client. For a charming girl like you, it's free. Lewis was very nice. Irma felt very embarrassed. She blushed. She was afraid to look directly at him, and she did it discreetly so he wouldn't notice. While Luis was looking around the corner, hoping to see a bus there, the girl was looking at Luis's stylish jacket, long legs, fashionable hat, brown hair. Irma even saw the barely noticeable charming mole above Luis's upper lip and the amazing color of his eyes. Not just brown, but like strong lending tea with honey. The bus finally came. The bus was overcrowded, and the crowd of passengers pressed Irma and Luis against each other. He's so tall and smells nice. The girl thought the couple remained silent. It was uncomfortable chatting in the crowd. Irma was excited and trembling being so close to Luis. She wished this ride would never end, but his stop was approaching. Aren't you getting off? She was surprised when he didn't move. No, the man replied. To be honest, I hope you'll let me walk you home. I really need your phone number, but in such a crowd, I just can't get my phone from my backpack to add your number. Frankly speaking, I don't want to lose you for another week and have to wait at the bus stop. Irma lowered her head so that Luis wouldn't notice her smiling. She was very pleased. He was charming. Her more and more. Luis's words sounded insistent but unobtrusive. He was funny and sweet. There was no point in refusing and she didn't want to. Luis gently led his new friend through the crowd and helped her down the steps. At the bus stop, they walked leisurely toward her building, telling each other about themselves. I am a law student. I'm going to graduate soon, and then I want to be a lawyer. Luis said, anyone in a difficult life situation may need a lawyer. This profession is in demand, but it is difficult. Our professor says that a lawyer is like a boxer not in terms of physical shape, but in the fact that the court is always a fight. That's very interesting. I'm still in my third year. I'm going to be a certified manager, but it's still a long way off. Irma replied, they talked the whole way and now they were standing in front of Irma's building. Luis took his phone out of his backpack and looked at his new friend expectantly. She smiled and told her phone number. It was a pleasure to meet you, Irma. I'll be sure to text you today. Luis promised and said goodbye. Well, here we go again, the same story. Irma was upset going up the stairs to her apartment. She was sure the situation called for their first kiss, but he just left again, and now there is only oppressive uncertainty. The next morning, Irma's phone vibrated. She got a call from an unknown number. Good morning. It's me, Luis. She heard. What do you think about theater? Hi. Yes. I love theater, but I haven't been there in a long time. She said the last time I went to the theater was back in high school. Well, then it's time to fix it. Luis said, laughing. I'll be waiting for you tomorrow at 5 p.m. near your building. Irma was very nervous as she was getting ready for her first date with Luis. She's been trying to choose the right outfit since early this morning. This blouse is too bright, she said, looking in the mirror and this skirt makes me look like a teenager. The girl's mother watched this scene chuckling softly. Sweetheart, you look like you're going to a ball at Buckingham Palace. The woman said and smiled. It's almost the same. I was invited to the theater, Rama said. 
The theater. That's wonderful. And who invited you? Mother asked Luis, my new friend. I told you about him. He gave me mimosas on the bus. Remember, Irma reminded her throwing aside another unsuitable outfit. You should wear something modest but elegant to go to the theater, her mother said, and helped Irma to choose the right outfit. The girl chose an elegant skirt, AS silk blouse and classic high-heeled shoes. And when Irma took off her coat in the foyer of the theater, she immediately caught the admiring glance of her friend Louis's eyes sparkled brighter than the spotlights, and he kept his eyes on her all the time. That evening passed, as if in a fog. Irma tried to watch what was happening on the stage of the theater, but she was not good at it. Sometimes Louis would say something in her ear and she would sit there like a monument. Irma couldn't help herself. They were so close to each other, sometimes touching arms, and it was as if it paralyzed her. It was as if she were the rabbit, and he was the boa depriving her of the ability to speak, to laugh, and even to think the actor playing the butler is brilliant, isn't he? Louise remarked again. Irma nodded in response. Louise was very close and she could feel his presence. Goosebumps were running down her skin and every time he leaned over to tell her something, it was as if a stream of hot water washed over her from head to toe. But the most incredible thing was that she felt something similar happening to him. It's just that Louise was so much better at hiding it when the play was finally over. Rama breathes, a sigh of relief near the closet. She was distracted by a venerable lady wearing a long, elegant dress and a fur cape. She was also holding a fan in her arms. It all looked very extravagant and grotesque. It's almost impossible to see such fashionistas on the city streets fascinated by the vivid sight. Irma lost her vigilance for a moment, and when she came to her senses, Louis had already handed her a coat even through the thick fabric of her coat, she felt Louis' hands when he touched her. Everything inside her clenched, his hands burned her. The man held his hands on her delicate shoulders for a while, and the wave of suffocation swept over Herma again so that she couldn't breathe. They got out of the subway and after catching a cab, Luis gallantly opened the door for her. He took the passenger seat next to the driver. This allowed Irma to catch her breath for a while, but only until Luis got out of the car first and gave her his hand. Ouch! The girl involuntarily exclaimed because when he took Irma's hand, it felt as if she had been struck by a stunned gun. Luis shuddered because he felt the same way. Both looked at each other in bewilderment static electricity. Irma said quietly rubbing her hand. Or maybe it's the spark that so many love novels talk about. Louis smiled back. Irma couldn't help but look into his eyes as she said goodbye. She sank into them like in a lake, dove in and came up again. Louis quickly said goodbye and left. She could not sleep half the night replaying in her head every phrase he said, every gesture, every glance. Only at dawn did the girl manage to fall asleep. Daughter, it's 12 o'clock. Are you going to get up? Her mother asked when she came into her room the next day. It's Sunday. I have the right to sleep. She said she did not want to tell her mother that she could not sleep at night, and when she woke up, her first thought was about Luis. That morning, Irma couldn't eat anything. She had two cups of coffee and started to prepare for her sociology exam. But in her thoughts, she was far from sociology and she was very sleepy. Louise called her unexpectedly. She wanted to squeal with joy when she heard his voice, it took a lot of effort not to do that. Would you like to go for a walk in the park tonight or go to the cinema? He suggested she certainly didn't want to spend two hours in paralysis. Again, like at the theater, I'd love to go for a walk. I really need some fresh air. She replied at 6 p.m. Luis was waiting for her in front of the entrance. When she saw him, Irma's heart raced. She couldn't breathe normally, but she didn't want to show her excitement and let him know how happy she was to see him again. She wanted to hug and kiss him, 
hold his hands, but instead she just nodded and greeting the young people walked leisurely through the alleys of the city park. Luis was telling a funny story from his childhood and suddenly without stopping to talk, he took Irma by the hand and did not let her go until the end of the walk. You are freezing. Let's go to a cafe. I know a good cafe nearby. They make really good cakes and hot chocolate. He suggested I'd love to. Irma said time flew by while they were enjoying hot drinks and eclairs. By the time they left the cafe, it was already dark. I don't want to let you go. Louis said when they stopped outside the building that I don't want to go, she answered and looked at him, and then he put his arms around her waist and kissed her. Irma wanted that kiss so badly, and finally it happened the next day at the university. Irma couldn't think about her studies. She was dreaming, remembering how she and Luis ate eclairs, how he squeezed her palm with his hot hands, how he embraced her outside the building and then touched her soft lips. She thought about it all at the university and then on the way home, and she was so immersed in her sweet thoughts that she almost missed her. Stop. What's next for her? And Luis, she wondered what is her future with him. She had no answer to these questions. All she knew was that she wanted to kiss him day and night without stopping. Irma and Luis met almost every day. Spring came to an end. The summer rains passed and autumn came. Irma introduced Luis to her parents. They liked her daughter's beloved. After half a year of romance, Luis also decided to introduce his girlfriend to his mother, Dahlia. By this time, he had already told Irma about his mother and even showed some pictures of her. Dahlia was an attractive slender woman, and at her 43, she looked like she was 30. She gave birth to Louis early, barely turning 18. Her spouse wasn't much older then. Their early marriage didn't withstand the trials and broke up a year later. Dahlia was already a single mother raising her only son. She never married again although she occasionally dated different men. Luis did not communicate with his father. He only knew that his father got married again and had children. Luis even knew where his father lived, but did not seek to meet him. He believed the man had betrayed him and his mother. Irma saw Dahlia's tremendous influence on her son. She was the absolute authority and standard of a woman to him, so Irma tried to do everything she could so that Dahlia would like her because she really wanted to be her son's wife. And her mother always taught her that she should be friends with her mother-in-law. That is the key to a happy family relationship on the day she met her potential mother-in-law, Irma bought her favorite cake at the mall. This. She met Luis, and together they went to his house. It had just rained, and judging by the approaching clouds, a second rainstorm was coming. The young people were in a hurry. Irma spent the morning carefully styling her hair and applying makeup. Now, she was worried about getting wet. She didn't want to ruin the hairstyle. Louise carried a box with a cake in one hand and squeezed Irma's palm with the other. The road was wet and slippery. Suddenly, Louise slipped. He tried to stay on his feet, but tripped over a rock. All of this happened in a matter of moments. Irma managed to grab Louis by the sleeve, but the cake was not so lucky. Louis swung his arm wide and the cake box flew like a bird, traveled a couple of meters and dropped to the ground. They picked up the mud-soaked box and stared at each other in confusion. There was no time to go back for another cake. They were already a bit late, and as far as Irma knew, Dahlia hated people who weren't punctual. She valued her time and the time of others. Punctuality was courtesy of kings. Louis's mother believed Irma could not make this woman wait for her. What would she think of her? After all, first impressions are very important. There was nothing to do. Luis and Irma had to go without a cake and in dirty clothes. Luis rang the doorbell of his house. Footsteps were heard, and a moment later, Dahlia opened the door. 
She was elegantly dressed with perfect makeup and hairstyle. She smiled broadly at the sight of her dear guest, and then froze in shock when she saw a couple in dirty clothes with a dirty crumpled box. But Dahlia knew how to control her emotions. She smiled again and invited the couple into the house while Luis and Irma were trying to clean themselves up in the bathroom. Dahlia opened the box. The cake was crumpled. The cream roses smeared and mixed in with the berries. It was now some kind of multicolored, creamy mixture, but it didn't affect the taste in any way. And when it was time to have tea, the cake turned out to be very delicious. Even Dahlia enjoyed eating a piece of cake. It's not the wrapping that counts, but the content. Dahlia said wisely. Louis' mother's charmed the girl, intelligent, educated, sociable. It was interesting to talk to her. The woman was also satisfied with her son's choice. Irma is modest, intelligent, and with a docile nature. She is a good match for my son. Dahlia concluded. Irma graduated with honors and got a job as a manager at a fitness center. After the first week of work, Louise took Irma out to a restaurant. Irma thought they would be celebrating her successes at work, but she was wrong. As soon as they were seated at the table, she saw two waiters carrying out a large basket of white roses. Louise noted to them, took a velvet box from his pocket and got down on one knee. My beautiful Irma. I never thought it was possible to fall in love so much. I beg you to be my wife. He said, solemnly and surprised Irma was speechless and tears came to her eyes. It was good that she hadn't bothered with makeup or else the mascara would have run down her face. Will you marry me? Luis asked. Looking hopefully at his beloved, he looked at Irma as if it were just the two of them in the restaurant, but there were dozens of curious people looking at them. Irma came to her senses and nodded, obviously, she said yes. Could she have said anything else? She could no longer imagine her life without Luis. The wedding was set for December 15th, wouldn't it be better to wait until spring or summer? Her mother suggested then we could celebrate the wedding in a beautiful garden. It's more romantic, but Irma didn't want to hear about it. Louise also wanted to tie his fate to her as soon as possible. I want to get married so much. He smiled at his fiance. I'm counting the days when we'll finally become husband and wife. She could not believe that soon she would be Louise's wife, like her fiance. She counted the days and made red marks on her calendar with a pencil rejoicing that the day when she would be the happiest girls in the world was approaching. At the beginning of December, they booked a restaurant and bought wedding rings, but Irma could not find the right wedding dress. She and her mother went through all the stores in the city, but she could not find anything suitable. Either the dress was too big or too small, or the color didn't fit, or there were too many or not enough crystals and lace. It seems to me that you don't know what you want. Her tired mother reproached her. Her mother was really tired and nervous for Irma, had made choosing a dress an impossible task. Irma was also very tired of it and would be glad to finally buy a dress, but how she didn't want to buy an ordinary dress after all, it's a special day in every woman's life, so the dress must be very special, and Irma knew she would definitely find that special dress. A friend told her about a new bridal shop downtown. Irma decided to go there alone so as not to disturb her mother who was tired from all the wedding fuss. She had no idea at the time that the trip would be fatal for her. That Saturday morning, Irma got up early, put on her robe and quietly trying not to wake. Her parents went into the kitchen. It was still dark, but she didn't turn on the light. She turned on the coffee machine and looked out the window. The pale waning moon gazed at her in a cold and unfriendly way. This made Irma uncomfortable. She was sipping her coffee and thought that soon her life would change completely and irrevocably. The world would remain the same, and the stars in the sky and the sun and the old oak tree outside their house. Everything will be the same except her life. She will move in with Luis and family life will begin. 
They will have a baby, then a second, maybe even a third baby. Her beloved dreams of creating a large family because he never had a full family. He only had his mother full of hope. Irma got into a cab and headed downtown. She sat in the back seat and dreamed of trying on her special dress, and tomorrow she will introduce Dahlia to her parents. The girl thought about what else she had to do before the wedding, but all the girl's plans were ruined. When the car suddenly spawned like a merry-go-round, the driver lost control and the car crashed into a fence at full speed. It all happened so fast that Irma didn't even have time to get scared. She felt as if someone just turned off the lights. When the girl woke up, she didn't understand where she was. There were wires, tubes, and four tubes everywhere. She tried to say something, but her lips were so dry that she could not utter a word. Try not to talk and don't worry. Everything is fine. The nurse came up and readjusted the patient's blanket. Wait a minute, I'll call your doctor. Irma had a terrible headache. She didn't understand what had happened to her. And for some reason she could not feel her legs at all. She could see them, but she could not move a finger. What's wrong? The girl could not understand. The doctor told her that she had been in a coma for three days. The doctors fought for her life. Fortunately, her young body was strong and won the battle for life. And soon Irma woke up. However, her spine was badly damaged in the crash. The doctor's verdict was like a bolt from the blue. She would never walk again and will be disabled forever. On December 15th, and instead of waltzing, Irma lay motionless in her hospital bed, there was always someone beside her, either her father or her mother. Louis came often to bringing flowers, favored Irma's chocolates and soft toys. He comforted her and tried to cheer her up, but every time she saw tears in his eyes, Irma wondered who. Louis felt more sorry for Rama or himself. They never talked about marriage again. They just tried to avoid the subject as if it had become taboo. Irma, I believe that you will get back on your feet. Louise repeated every time stubbornly refusing to accept the doctor's diagnosis. But when it was time to buy a wheelchair, the boy's hopes for his fiancée's recovery were shattered. Three days before she was discharged from the hospital, Dahlia suddenly showed up in Irma's room. Before that, she had only texted her encouraging messages, but she never even called. May I come in? The woman asked, knocking on the door. She was elegantly dressed as usual, and even the hospital shoe covers, which the nurse gave her. Looks stylish over her shoes. Sure, the girl rejoiced. I missed you so much. Mom. This is Dahlia. She introduced Louis's mother. Hello. It's nice to meet you. Alma's mother greeted her sincerely. I imagined our first meeting a little differently. There's nothing we can do about this situation. The Almighty must have a special plan for our family. Dahlia smiled broadly, but she didn't say anything back. I'd like to talk to Herma alone if possible. She said delicately. Of course, Irma's mother nodded and left the hospital room. Dahlia brought a big, beautiful bouquet and a thick book. It's to keep you entertained. The woman explained and sat down on a chair next to her. Dahlia was acting a little strange. Usually she was confident, but now she was embarrassed nervously rubbing her chiffon scarf with her fingers as if she wanted to say something but didn't dare, and then suddenly she knelt in front of Herma which both shocked and frightened the girl, I beg you. Leave Louis. She exclaimed, Irma, my girl. You didn't really love each other, nothing serious. Just a little romance, a little affection that you mistook for a real feeling because of your inexperience. Dahlia, we love each other. A confused, Derma answered. What kind of love are you talking about? Luis's mother raised her eyebrows in surprise. Believe me, darling. You and my son have no idea what it is. 
I was in the same situation, so I know what I'm talking about. At first, we think it's love to the grave, but then we find out that there was no love at all. Just a hormonal storm. Bitter disappointment comes with understanding this. Isn't it better to break up right now? Irma couldn't believe her ears. She understood what Dahlia was trying to tell her, but she didn't want to believe it. Do you want us to break off our engagement? The girl asked, I want you to do this. The woman clarified in a stern voice, I cannot make this decision for Luis. Irma began, but Dahlia interrupted her. You know my son. He is a real gentleman and a very decent person. Luis will never leave you even if he will suffer because of you. She sobbed, suffer. We love each other. He and I both dreamed of a family. Irma said, uneasily. Exactly. Don't you understand that? You can forget about having a normal family. Now, Luis wanted children and I wanted grandchildren. But now the hopes for a bright future are clouded. I know you're proud and you're smart. You know that he will marry you out of nobility. Out of pity of a cripple. Do you really need it? Please break up with him. Kick him out. Just do it in any possible way. Irma was silent. Tension seemed to hang in the very air. I guess you hate me right now. Dahlia suggested but try to understand me. I'm a mother and every mother wants the best for her child. You know that Luis is my only son. I've sacrificed my whole life for him to have a decent life. And it hurts me to see my child suffer so much. Do you think I don't suffer or must smile bitterly? And what about my parents? You just saw my mother. She is depressed. Yes. I understand your fate is crippled. I am sincerely sorry for what happened. The woman nodded. I sincerely sympathize with you and your parents, but is it fair to drag an innocent man into the abyss with you? It seems to me that only selfish people do that. Irma was shocked just a month ago, this woman had smiled at her, hugged her, and called her daughter, and now please go away. She asked, trying to hold back her tears. Only when Dahlia left the room did Irma burst into bitter tears. She rarely allowed herself to cry. She always controlled herself, but at that moment, there was no mental or physical strength left. Those people who say that the most powerful human weapon is the tongue are right, every word from Dahlia pierced the girl's heart like a sharp knife. When mom came back into the room, Arma was crying with her face on the pillow, and she couldn't stop. Her mother even had to call a nurse who injected her daughter with a sedative. Don't blame her. My girl, Alma's mother, tried to comfort her. Everyone wants happiness for their children. Parents will do anything for their children's happiness. Some are even ready to do something really cruel. But don't worry, sweetheart, everything will be fine. You'll see. Just don't give up and pray. Irma didn't believe a word her mother said at the time. How could everything be all right when life was falling apart? The next day, Luis came in as if nothing had happened. Judging by his behavior, he didn't know about Dahlia's visit yesterday. Irma didn't tell him about the unpleasant conversation. Luis told her about the troubles at work, about the increased price of gasoline and some other nonsense, but she barely listened to him. Don't come to me anymore, she said in interrupting him. What do you mean? I don't understand you, Irma. Why shouldn't I come? He wondered, stop acting like a gentleman. She answered, you know, you can't help me anyway. Now I have my life and you have yours. Our paths do not intersect. Now Irma's voice trembled and she turned to the wall so as not to look at Luis in this difficult moment and not to show her true feelings. The last thing she wanted was for him to disappear from her life. Do you think I am a coward? Do you think I am a traitor? Luis exclaimed. I will prove to you that I am not there is no your life and mind. 
There is only our life. This is our common path, and we must walk it together. Luis, don't be so dramatic. You owe me nothing. You shouldn't sacrifice yourself. Irma answered proudly. It's not going to work out between you and me. Luis was silent for a few minutes, but it seemed like an eternity to Irma. Okay, but remember, it's what you wanted. He finally interrupted the ominous silence in the room. Goodbye forever. The young man left carefully closing the door behind him. Irma could not believe that he had left her just like that. She insisted on breaking up, but deep in her heart, she hoped that he would fight for their love, that he would text her, call her, and will come to pick her up from the hospital, but he did none of that. Luis betrayed her. He betrayed their love. He killed the feeling that had braided them together, binding them into a single knot that she felt was impossible to untie. It turned out that their bond was very easy to break just one wave of the hand, one phrase, goodbye forever. And that was it. No love, no passion, nothing, only emptiness, pain, and disappointment. Thus began a new chapter in Irma's destiny. Her parents took her home with a bouquet of flowers and a wheelchair. They didn't talk about anything on the way home. There was silence in the car. Irma looked out the window. The lights of the big city flashed there. Just like the night she had returned from university and first met Luis. The parents asked the cab to stop in front of the pharmacy. Mom had to buy medicine for Irma. The doctor gave a long list of medications for her daughter. I wish I could take all the pills at once and fall asleep forever or a thought she didn't want to live. When she entered her home in a wheelchair, she couldn't help herself and burst into tears right in the hallway. Her father carried her into the bathroom and her mother helped her undress and take a shower. One drop streamed down the girl's face mixed with bitter tears. Irma rubbed herself with the washcloth fiercely. She wanted to wash away the hospital, smell her illness. She wanted to wash away her past, and Louis touched forever. Then her parents helped her to sit down at the table. Her mother brewed coffee and in the comfort of her home, the girl gradually calmed down. That night, she slept soundly in her room. But in the morning, the pain came again. When in the drawer of her desk, she found a beautiful card with two swans in the middle of a lake in white flowers, two wedding rings, glittered, and gold above them, it was the wedding invitation that she and Luis had signed shortly before the tragedy. And now Irma was holding the postal with shaking hands. Why had this happened to me? Why she did not understand? Irma cried again and tore the hateful invitation into small pieces and then wept for a long time, covering her face with her cold hands on the eve of her daughter's discharge. Her mother cleaned the apartment carefully, getting rid of everything that could hurt Irma, but she was not in the habit of rummaging through her daughter's belongings. And so now she listened to Irma crying. Irma asked her mother to bring her a metal bowl and matches the girl, put the scraps of invitations in the bowl and set it on fire. And then she hugged her mother, and together they watched her dream burning. It was never destined to come true. Irma checked her phone every hour deep in her suffering soul. She still hoped that she would see missed calls or messages from Luis. She thought it would be easier if he sent a message saying that he was sorry, that he was worried, and that he wants to fix everything, wants his beloved back. One night the doorbell rang Irma flinched in surprise. Her parents were not expecting visitors. Hope flashed in the girl's heart for a moment. What if it was Louise who had come to see her to repent and to ask for forgiveness? Irma frantically began to adjust her clothes and brush her hair, but in vain, it was only a neighbor who had come to ask for salt. Days went by and Louise never called. He got rid of her as if she were a broken, unwanted toy. Her brain burned with the realization of betrayal. Irma cursed the day. Louise had given her those damn yellow flowers, and she scolded herself for trusting the man who became her first man and then abandoned her when the first problem arose. 
Love got under her skin and got her excited. This feeling made her naively believe that Luis needed her as much as he needed air, and that she was the one and only Irma wished she had felt nothing at all. Then she wouldn't feel pain, wouldn't feel resentment, and the realization of betrayal wouldn't burn her heart. Irma became depressed. She did not leave her room for days and just lay in bed. Looking at the wall, she felt as if her life like a porcelain cup had fallen and shattered into small pieces. She felt like a wounded bird lying at the bottom of a ravine, dying a bird that was never meant to fly again. Now she could see her beloved only in her dreams. When Irma slept, she saw her wedding dress. She danced in the snow-white dress under the admiring gaze of Louis. And every time morning came, she didn't want to wake up and be trapped in that cruel, unfair world full of betrayal. Again, Irma. Sweetheart, why don't you cry? It will make you feel better. Her mother's warm hand touched the girl's thin shoulder. It hurts me to watch you suffer. You haven't left your room in days and you don't say anything to. Daddy and I are very worried. I can't, mommy. Maybe I should, but I can't. Tears are water, but everything inside me is burning. Burning as if a fire is raging. Irma answered quietly. Her eyes were dry and hot. Irma, honey, you need to eat something. Please, sweetheart, her mother pleaded with her. I don't want to. Her daughter answered again and again. At least drink some tea or you'll get dehydrated. The restless woman said sometimes Irma would give up and have a cup of tea just so they would leave her alone. Poor parents, as she felt sorry for them. They were losing their minds from their helplessness. One day, Irma's father bought her favorite cake to please his daughter. Looking at the creamy roses and berries, the girl immediately remembered the day she met Dahlia. Irma's face remained with suffering. She was so happy then, and now she's suffering. She tried to forget everything, get it out of her head, but nostalgia came over her like an ocean wave. Every time Irma closed her eyes, she saw Luis, his brown hair, his mole above his upper lip that she loved to kiss, and his wonderful eyes. She loved the color of London tea with honey. Irma was disgusted to look at herself in the mirror. She could not accept the fact that now she was just a nobody. The word disabled made the girl suffer even more. It all seemed like a bad nightmare that was about to end. Her life was divided into before and after love. Friends and happy days were left in that bright and blissful past. Now all her friends disappeared, and Irma was left alone. She was very lonely and sad. Yes, she loved interesting books, movies, and good music, but they couldn't replace the warmth of simple human interaction. Six months later, Herma and her mother went to a specialized health center for people with disabilities, which was located at the seaside. At first, the girl didn't want to go anywhere. Why should I go there? Do you really think I want to go on vacation now? She asked. I won't be able to swim anyway, Irma, honey, at least there you can get some fresh air. Listen to the sound of the sea. Watch the waves. She persuaded her daughter. Eventually, Irma agreed she didn't want to go anywhere, but she didn't want to upset her parents either. She knew it had taken an enormous effort for her father to get the tickets. The health center turned out to be quite good and comfortable. In addition to the therapeutic procedures, there were a lot of interesting activities. Irma was a little shy the first couple of days, but gradually she got used to that place and she even liked it. Once out of curiosity, she attended a checkers tournament and there she met Barbara, a middle-aged woman. This woman's story impressed Irma. Barbara had once been a champion equestrian, but after an unfortunate fall from a horse, the woman became disabled and her sports career was forever forgotten. It seemed that life had collapsed, but Barbara had a devoted and loving spouse and children by her side. For the sake of her family, she did not allow herself to fall into despondency. Barbara kept moving forward. 
She entered university and obtained a degree in psychology. Finished postgraduate studies and became a PhD. Eventually, the woman opened a private psychological care clinic. Now she provides counseling and helps people overcome difficult situations. It wasn't easy, but I tried to set myself up in a positive way. Barbara admitted, Irma, you know, my life wasn't over, which meant I had to move on. Trust me, everything will work out if you want it and strive for it. I accepted my condition and learned to live, to take care of myself, to clean my apartment, to cook for my family, to do laundry, to iron. I was learning it all from scratch and it took time, but eventually I started to live a normal life. Irma, you have to understand that disability is not a disease. It's a lifestyle. Your life is not in danger. You are just like any other person, but with some mobility limits. You can do whatever you want. Study, travel, make friends, and enjoy every day of your life. Barbara's words gave Irma hope for the future. It was just a small step toward a better life, but Irma had already taken that step. Maybe it isn't over yet. The girl thought optimistically. For the first time in a long time, maybe I could do something useful just like this. Amazingly strong woman, I could become helpful to society. Despite my disability, Barbara remained an incredibly cheerful person. People liked her and she tried to give everyone a little bit of her attention. Irma was more fortunate than the others. This woman had become a kind of older friend and mentor to her. It was very interesting and fun with her. She had already forgotten how wonderful it is to chat with someone lightheartedly over a cup of tea. Her eldest son, Elias, whom she soon introduced to Irma, was at the health center with Barbara and helped her with everything. It so happened that they were inseparable for three weeks. Elias gave the young mother's friend some signs of attention and made beautiful compliments, but she did not take them seriously. She was very pleased, but she thought he was doing it out of politeness. The morning before departure, Irma and Barbara were drinking coffee together on the terrace. Tell me, haven't you noticed that my son fell in love with you, or are you just ignoring that fact? Barbara asked. What are you talking about? It's impossible. Irma exclaimed choking on her coffee. Elias is an attractive young man. I can't hide it. I like him very much. I think all the girls like him. He's handsome, strong, intelligent, but he's a healthy normal man and I'm disabled. What kind of feelings are we talking about? So what? Barbara was indignant. Do you think you're not a human being, not a woman? Why do you think it is impossible to fall in love with you? The girl lowered her head. You've made up some limits for yourself. Barbara continued but daring. Believe me, this world has no limits. All the limits are in your head and you decide which way you want to go. To suffer. Blame everyone for your misfortunes or to live your life to the fullest, enjoying every day, breathing deep or snoozing quietly in the corner. In this world, everyone has the right to personal happiness. My husband is a very attractive man, but despite my disease, he has never cheated on me just because he likes to be with me. I do not complain. I do not grumble about fate, and I live my life with a smile on my face. I can't walk, but that doesn't stop me from living my life to the fullest. You should not give up on yourself. You have to believe that you still have everything ahead of you. Irma went home, but Barbara's words stuck deep in her heart. Meeting this woman had completely turned her mind. She impressed Irma with her attitude toward life. How bravely, how calmly she accepted the fact of her disability without any anger. Irma was impressed by Barbara's desire to live and decided to completely change her destiny. Irma thought that Elias would quickly forget about her, but she was wrong. He called and texted several times a day. They chatted and laughed. Irma tried to make sure that their communication did not cross the safe line because she was afraid that she would be hurt again. 
she could see that Elias liked her. She could feel it, but she wouldn't let herself think that they would be together. She was afraid of falling in love with him. The girl was very afraid of opening her heart and getting burned again. May I visit you? Elias asked one day during their conversation. He had been hinting at a meeting for a long time. Irma was confused and there was an awkward pause. Why do you need it? What for? She asked. Frankly speaking, I thought a lot about it. When I came back from the health center, I didn't know if I should call you or not. I liked you a lot and I thought about you all the time, but I knew I had no right to give you any hope. I wondered if we could have a future together, but you struck me in the heart and I couldn't resist. You know, I always thought women were much more cunning than men. I had an unfortunate experience. I had a girlfriend and she was nice to me, but she used me as a toy, and you, you are different. You are so warm and sincere. You are real. I've never met a girl like you before. Soon Elias came to visit Irma and stayed with her for a week. Her parents warmly welcomed their daughter's friend. Every day, Elias took Irma to the park where they strolled through the fall alleys. He carefully adjusted her blanket to keep her warm, and when he kissed her for the first time, Irma burst into tears, which frightened him greatly. I thought I would never find love again. And then suddenly you came into my life, she confessed. Please trust me. Elias reassured her. I know you're scared, but not all guys are like your ex. Just trust me. The warm relationship with the young man. His attention and his frankness helped her forget about her dramatic experiences and look at the world from a different angle to write her life story from scratch. Elias and Irma started dating and a new, wonderful E&D feeling arose in their hearts. The young man traveled to her city every weekend just to see her, to hug her, to hold her hand. One day on International Women's Day, Elias brought Irma, a bunch of mimosas. The girl looked at the yellow bouquet, and to her great surprise did not feel any pain. They did not remind her of her broken heart and Louis. Now, there were just beautiful flowers given to her by her beloved Elias. That day, he asked Irma's parents for their blessing. I feel in my heart that Irma is a part of me. Elias confessed. I want us to become a family. Three months later, Irma and Elias were married. Surprisingly, this time she easily found the right wedding dress. As soon as she and her mother showed up at the first bridal shop, she saw Ima exclaimed. This is my lucky dress. After the wedding, the young couple stayed with Irma's parents. It was more comfortable that way. The newly born family was fully supported by her husband, but Irma wanted to work too. The example of her wise, strong mother-in-law inspired her and made her act first. Irma got her driver's license. Elias insisted on it. He also gave her a fancy car. Then Irma attended a manicure course. Since she had a university degree in management, she knew a lot about management and decided to open her own nail studio. Her parents helped her find a suitable building, and Elias applied for a loan and equipped her studio with everything she needed. Now, Irma had a nail studio. This she worked, did what she loved, and interacted with interesting people. The business was thriving, and Irma even had to hire two employees soon. She also hired a hairdresser, then a massage therapist, and bought a vertical solarium. So a small nail studio turned into a real beauty center. Her beauty center was known for its top quality services and excellent customer care, and the number of clients was growing every day. One day, the door of her beauty center opened and she saw Dahlia. Dahlia came to get her hair done. Irma, what are you doing here? The woman was surprised. This is my beauty center. She answered proudly. Dahlia saw a wedding ring on Irma's ring finger. Did you get married? She asked, yes, I got married and I'm incredibly happy. Orma answered. 
Louis got married recently. Dahlia said, see, everything worked out very well. I was right after all. I told you at the hospital that you would be fine and that you would find your true love. Dahlia smiled, but her smile didn't look sincere. Yes, you were right or my answered. Now I am truly happy and loved. At that moment, the hairdresser invited Dahlia to sit down in a chair near a large mirror. The woman obediently followed the hairdresser with a puzzled face. It seemed to Irma that Dahlia had something else to say, but Irma didn't want to talk to Dahlia at all. There was no point in dwelling on the past. That evening, Elias came home very excited. He took off his shoes and rushed to his wife. This is our chance. We cannot miss it. He exclaimed holding an envelope in his hands. Can you explain what happened? His wife asked, and Elias told her that Barbara had found out about a doctor at the Munich clinic a few years ago. He helps hopeless patients to get back on their feet. Even those doomed to disability. My mom contacted this doctor. Unfortunately, he could not help her, but she advised me to send him your medical records. I did it secretly from you as I did not want to give false hope, and today I got the answer. The doctor is ready to operate on you. He thinks that there is a good chance that you'll be able to get back on your feet. No, it's impossible. There must be some mistake. The doctors told me that it's not possible. Irma answered. Doctors are humans. They can make mistakes. Elias answered. I think we have to try. Is it really possible? Will I walk again? Irma couldn't believe it when she went with her husband to Germany to see the neurosurgeon like her family. She was afraid to hope for a miracle, but still the surgery and further rehabilitation were successful. A year later, Irma fully recovered and three months later she found out she was expecting a baby. There were many complications and pregnancy was not easy, but Irma was unspeakably lucky with doctors. Their professionalism. Elias' care and endless support helped to give birth to a healthy and beautiful baby girl. Irma named her Monica. Four years later. Irma gave birth to a son and one spring afternoon walking with him in the park. She saw a man walking toward her with a shaky gait. She did not immediately recognize him. It was Luis when he saw his former fiancé. The man could not believe his eyes. Irma, is that you? He was surprised you. You are walking. Irma smelled Theodore of alcohol when they were together. Luis didn't drink alcohol. He looked really bad. Dark circles under his eyes. Untidy. Stubble. Yes. I can walk. As you can see, Irma smiled. Also, I can run, swim, work out, and dance. But how is that possible? Luis wondered. I mean, your diagnosis when you have a loving and caring husband, everything is possible. By the way, this is our youngest son, Rina Irma, introduced the baby. Luis looked at the little angel in the stroller with admiration and sadness. He winked at the baby who looked at the strange man with distrust and turned away. The boy obviously didn't like the untidy man, and I have no children. He sighed. But you are married, aren't you? Irma asked. I was. We divorced last year, all because we never became parents. My wife underwent a lot of medical procedures and tests, and eventually it turned out that I was the problem. I can't have kids. Isn't that funny? I don't think so. Sid Irma, I feel sorry for you. Or maybe God punished me for being a bastard and leaving you in difficult times. Do you think I'm a jerk? Luis asked. No, I don't think so. Irma, Sid, to be honest, I don't think about you at all. You know, it's all for the best. Now I'm grateful to fate that everything turned out this way. Life has put everything in its place. 
If not for that accident, I would not have become what I am now. Would not have achieved all that I have and did not meet the main person in my life. But we loved each other, didn't we? He asked stammering and looking into Irma's eyes. Do you recall the day we first met? Irma's voice broke the silence, drawing them back to a distant memory. You were sitting on the bus, consumed by sadness. But Irma swiftly interrupted her own recollection. I prefer not to dwell on the past. When true happiness engulfs you, there is no need to look back. Louise, sensing a hint of unease in her tone, ventured, but what if one isn't happy? His voice trembled with a touch of anxiety. I often think of you, Irma, he continued, his words laced with regret. I reminisce about the day we shared at the theater, and that fateful moment when we dropped that cursed cake. It haunts me, and I struggle to find my way forward. It feels like I've missed something crucial. Seeking solace, he pleaded, will everything be all right? Irma, her eyes brimming with compassion, assured him, hold on to hope and don't give up. You still have a long journey ahead of you. Regretfully, she added, now, I must take my leave. My son and I need to go. With that, Irma addressed her ex-fiancé, and with a stroller in tow, she walked away. Louis watched her departing figure, his gaze filled with an unbearable yearning. If you're enjoying this conversation, feel free to leave a like and subscribe to the channel.